everybody, my name is Spammels and welcome to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the Mystified Murderess. This game came out back in 1991, but what sets it apart from all the other ones we've played is that it features live action sequences. Looks very interesting, but it is an old game, so as such, it's going to have a sense of nostalgia to it. Now, it's going to be a long episode, so if that's not your jam, jog on, but if it is, get some popcorn, get back into bed without any more stalling. Let's begin! Welcome to the game, everybody! Within the sitting room of 221B Baker Street, Dr. John Watson recounts the daily news for Holmes as the great detective listens, hoping the Times contains a case worthy of his sloping skills. Let's begin. Society burglar strikes again. Mm, series of burglaries. Six over the period from June 2nd to June 17th. On July 2nd, the 7th occurred at the home of Sir Sanford Leeds. Cleopatra Tiara stolen, it says. As in the other cases, uh, no sign of extensive search by the thief, and only one piece of jewelry involved. Victims elsewhere at the time. Here's a complete list of the particulars, Holmes, if you'd care to read it. I believe you'll find them in the study. How do you do, gentlemen? I am Gerald Locke. Please be seated, Mr. Locke. How can we be of service? Three days ago, Guy Clarendon was found murdered at Halliday's. It's preposterous. But Miss Frances Nolan has been charged and is being detained at the criminal court, Old Bailey. Frances Nolan? Ah, yes. Sister of Loretta Nolan. Only surviving heirs of Sir Malcolm Nolan, founder of the Aberdeen Navigation Company. I seem to recall that Sir Malcolm and Lady Nolan were killed when some lunatic threw a bomb into their carriage. It seems to me that later I heard something about it being a case of mistaken identity. Wasn't one of their little offspring in the carriage with them at the time? Yes, it was Loretta, Francis's sister. She was only four. Miraculously, she was uninjured. Mr. Locke, I've heard that you are a suitor for Miss Francis Nolan's hand, are you not? Yes. And was it not also true that she was being courted by Guy Clarendon? Unfortunately, yes. Have you any idea why Francis Nolan was charged with the crime? Ah, uh, well... She was discovered over the body with a pistol in her hand. That would do it. But you don't understand. Francis is totally incapable of murder, not even of a scoundrel such as Guy Clarendon. Scoundrel? But he's from such blue blood. Also, if I'm not mistaken, he's an accomplished batsman for the West London Cricketeers, a ranked fencer in international competition. He was also a bit of a bounder, Watson. What an understatement. Guy Clarendon was excessively fond of cards and strong drink. His father had all but disinherited him. I tried to tell Francis that Clarendon was no good, but to no avail. And now look at the mess she's in. Will you help? Most certainly. We have a case! How about that, everybody? That dude, like the guy, Lockhart guy, his eyes, like they just kept bulging open. So let's go over the notes real quickly. Let's establish the facts because before anything happens, we need data, we need facts, and can someone get me a drink? Now, unlike other Sherlock games we played in the past, I'm actually gonna use a notepad to help me out with this one. I broke it down to victims, people, suspects, and locations, because I feel it might come in use during this game. But anyway, people involved. So Guy Clarendon has been murdered, killed at Halliday's private hotel. The suspect is a Francis Nolan, for reasons being that she was found over the body with a gun. However, this Gerald Locke guy who has a bit of a soft spot for Francis is here to defend her honor, saying she would never do such a thing. He spoke about how her family got killed when a bomb blew up in their carriage and mentioned that she had a sister I think called Lotta. She's currently been held at the Old Bailey. And that's all we got to go on just now. Right, so we have newspapers we can use to peruse for clues. But I don't want to touch them just yet. We have a directory. Now this is full of names and places that we can then choose to go and talk to and visit and search for clues. Now, with any good investigation, we've got to get a hold of the facts. Facts to suit theories rather than theories to suit facts. Or was it the other way around? I can never remember. So the murder took place at Halliday's private hotel. How about we go to the scene of the murder, see what clues we can dig up. Since the private hotel plays such an important part in the murder of Clarendon, Watson insists that they pay Halliday's a visit. To Watson's surprise, Holmes agrees. Clarendon, poor chap. He arrived on the 29th day of May and was given a front room on the third floor. Two days later, he asked to be moved to suite 205. To your knowledge, did he have any visitors? Only two that I'm aware of. One was a most disagreeable fellow. 
He was rather large, had a thick walrus moustache and a very prominent scar down his cheek. He arrived on the 1st of June, well, the very day of Mr. Clarendon's move. He simply came in, sat down in the lobby and waited. Twenty minutes or so later, Mr. Clarendon came down from his room. The big man yanked him aside. I was about to send for a bobby when Mr. Clarendon signed me that all was well. After a few minutes, they left together. I never saw the man again. His other visitor, who came by quite frequently, was a most striking woman. She was quite fashionably dressed. She had a most distinctive <laughs> laugh, very full and deep. I've no idea who she was. Please, uh, tell us about the morning of July 2nd. It was about nine o'clock when a woman entered. She was rather plain looking and I wouldn't have noticed her, except for the fact that she came in the front door looking neither left nor right and proceeded directly up the staircase. It couldn't have been more than 30 seconds later when I heard a bang followed by a woman's scream. I dashed upstairs to the second floor. The door to room 205 was open. Inside, I found the body of Mr. Clarendon and the woman who'd just come up. She was lying in a swoon in the center of the room with a pistol in her hand. I revived her with some whiskey. When she came to, she was totally disoriented. She had no idea where she was or what she'd done. When she saw Clarendon's body, she let out a shriek and dropped the pistol. I summoned the police. Tell me, at what hour are the hotel's front doors locked? Oh, ten o'clock, sir. Mm. Anyone who arrives after that has to be let in by the night staff. Of course, Mr. Clarendon was never one of those. He was always in his room before ten. May we see his room? Moments later, everybody, up in the room of the Clarendon guy who died. Jolly happy music. What do we hear, Watson? Appears to be a bank statement. Oh. He's being blackmailed, I think. Holmes, appears the maid missed a spot in a sweeping. Good thing she did, Watson. You're staring at evidence. Hmm. Blood. What's this stain here? Smells like a fine sherry. Looks like someone's been celebrating. The question is, was it with the body or over it? Nothing much here. A couple of shirts and uh, three pair of shoes. But what you failed to notice, my dear Watson, is that one of the pairs of shoes is canvas and has been dyed black. Interesting. A sweater and trousers. An ensemble in black. Not much of a view. All I can see is a brick wall of the building across the alley. Hmm. Ivy Vines binding up a trellis. Well, how about that, everybody? The plot thickens. So, Guy Clarendon was staying at the Halliday Inn. He originally had a room on the third floor facing forwards at the front of the hotel, but two days after requested to be moved to room 205, they had a rear-facing view. The window itself looked onto a brick wall, but had a vine trellis that one potentially might be able to climb up. Prior to his murder on the night before, a, a loud, boisterous, well-dressed lady came to visit. He was also threatened by Harry Potter, a guy with a scar on his cheek and a black clothes. And then we saw this bank statement inside this hotel from what came across to me as blackmail Like the money was being taken out over a long period of time And then finally the last lady to come in on the day of the murder was Francis who went up the room The receptionist heard a bang went up and she was there immediately You can tell this isn't how it seems they want us to think that she shot him What have I done? Oh swoon and then like fell down only to get back up and then have another freak out Oh, he's still dead them swoon down again. Why is it that the black clothes are in his room that's suggestive that they belong to the man in black who's threatening him? We need to know more. We need more data, damn it. How about Inspector Lestrade? Let's go and speak to him, see what his thoughts and opinions are of the case as it currently stands. While not relishing the thought of interacting with the condescending Lestrade, Holmes and Watson visit Scotland Yard anyway, hoping the man has done his due diligence in this case and can offer insights. I wouldn't hold your breath. Why even trouble yourself with this one, Holmes? You believe Francis Nolan to be guilty? <laughs> guilty as a cat would swallow a canary. And on what do you base that brilliant deduction? Look, Francis Nolan claims not to have known that Clarendon was residing at Halliday's. Yet she proceeded directly to his room where she shot the bloke. She claims not to have owned a gun. Yet the gun found in her hand was purchased at S. Goff and the receipt had her name on it, for Christ's sake. 
No, that little lady will never see the light of day again. Johnny Music with a jail slammer. So a gun was purchased a couple days prior from a S. Goff, I think he said. Well, the Strahd's true to form believes that she is the killer because she was on the scene with a gun and it's in her name. What would it take for someone else to register a gun in her name? Maybe her sister did it. Ooh! Didn't, um, Gerald Locke? He said Francis was, like, really into him. Clearly, on the night before, he had another girl visiting him. Maybe that was Lotta? Well, there's S. Goff. We'll check him out in one second. Gerald Locks, go pay him a quick visit. Watson is surprised when Holmes agrees to his suggestion of talking to Gerald Locke a second time to see if anything new come to light. We have just a few more questions for you, Mr. Locke, if you don't mind. Of course not. Anything to help Francis. We were wondering if you could shed some light on Miss Francis' relationship with Guy Clarendon. He was only after her money. I tried to tell Francis as much. But she wouldn't hear of it. We had a bit of a row over it. I've been quite upset about the whole thing. Upset enough to commit murder? What an outrageous accusation. It was only a question, Mr. Locke. Preposterous. Besides, I've been on holiday all week, playing cribbage at the annual tournament up at Leeds. Sounds positively riveting. Oh, it was. Okay, well, that did give us some new information. So, you know, Francis, she was like wealthy. She was well-to-do. She had money. And it seems ironic that uh, Guy Clarendon, uh, that's the guy, yeah, Guy, guy Clarendon, he seemingly is being blackmailed, needs money, so he's desperately trying to get with Francis, who has now apparently got money. Right, next, let's, oof, we've, got, we've, got, we've got some options here, right? So we could go to the Old Bailey, perhaps, and get a, have a word with Francis herself. That would probably be helpful. But then we could go to the gun shop. Let's do that, actually. It'd be good to get what he says before going to her, so that we haven't got to go back and forth and stuff like that. Goth begin knowing that there are surprisingly few gun shops in the city and that this might figure into the innocence of guilt of Miss Nolan the men take a stroll through the darkened streets to S Goffs do you remember a woman who came in recently and purchased a derringer oh matter of fact I do sir we don't get women in here very often especially not alone and I'll particularly remember that one because she was so pretty and uh, she looked like she really knew how to have a good time if you'll pardon the expression do you remember her name? I should say I do. She repeated it twice whilst I was filling out the order form. Seems like it was very important to her that I get her name right. Let me see, it was um, Francis, no, uh, less, uh, well, well, it was Francis something or other, sir. Well, how about that for a big old clue? We go back to the testimony of the hotel, the Holidays Private Hotel clerk. He described the lady the night before being a fabulous, well-dressed, uh, delightfully beautiful woman, something like that. But he described Francis as, uh, I, I forget the exact wording, but as a lowly, like, frail, just a, a, a mute nobody of a woman. Well, the gun shop owner clearly didn't describe Francis, he described this other woman. And this other woman made point to, like, make sure he got my name, it's Francis with an F. Thank you for the gun. My name is Francis with a capital F. I think it's about time we paid the sister a visit because I'm thinking my beer. But what could this all be for? Like, what's the end goal here? Maybe the sister's after the family wealth? Loretta, not Lotta, Loretta Nolan. I bring it on, Loretta. Feeling that Loretta Nolan may have some insights into her sister's predicament, the two detectives head out of the door and onto Baker Street in search of a handsome cab. Enter and be recognized. Recognized! <laughs> oh, you don't wish to play Her Majesty, eh? Very well. You do not seem particularly disturbed by the recent turn of events, Miss Nolan. Each of us grieves in his own way, Mr. Holmes. It must be difficult for you to face the possibility that your own sister may have killed your dearest chum. Guy was fun to be with. And as for Frances, I love her dearly, but, well, it's funny to think Miss Right and Proper has finally gotten herself into a bit of a jam. Miss Nolan, may I ask, when was the last time you saw Guy Clarendon? Let me think. I believe it was the Richmond's party last Thursday. Yes, I'm sure of it. God, we did cut it up a bit there. <laughs> and after the party? We did not go home together, if that's what you're implying. 
that would have broken Francis's heart. She was head over heels for Guy, you know. She had some foolish notion that he was going to marry her. Not that someone like him ever would. But I do recall her saying, and it might have been the night of his death, that she was going to have a talk with him about their future. Ah, da, da. We have some clues there to work with. Um, so she says that she last saw Guy on the, at the on the first day at the Richmond's party. She seemed rather happy that her goody two shoes sister had finally found herself in a bit of bother. She also didn't seem happy about Guy and Francis getting married. Seemingly felt like Guy was better suited with herself, perhaps. The two of them could have a good time together. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that it was Loretta that actually went to visit him the night before the murder at the hotel, although she didn't admit to that. But she sure meets the description that the guy on the front desk at the hotel described. And she fits the description of the S. Goff's gun store clerk person. Right, where can we go next? Well, looking at my notes, I mean, there's the blackmail angle, so maybe we could find a bank, but then they're not going to tell us any information. Um, we have the, the party, Richmond's party. Maybe we can find someone there to talk to about that. And then we have Frances herself. Maybe it's time we go speak to Frances. Or how about, does Guy Clarendon have any next of kin? Is his parents still alive? Has he got a brother or sister? The Sir Francis Clarendon, the Guy Clarendon, and a Frank Clarendon. But what happens if we try and visit the dead person? Despite the hour, the pair realized that they would be remiss not to visit the home of Guy Clarendon in search of information. I question why we have come to this location. If clues are what we are seeking, then we are in the wrong place altogether. But how about that, everybody? That was a waste of time. We have Frank Clarendon and Sir Francis. Let's just try these. Well, he certainly was a chatty fellow. But I got the distinct feeling that he had no idea why I came to this location. Right, well, that's another big old dead end. That only leaves Sir Francis. If there is a family, this will be him. Hoping to gain some insight from the bereaving father, Holmes and Watson hail a handsome cab and head over to the Clarendon Estates. This is a difficult thing for a man to say about his only son. But Guy was a wastrel and a ne'er do well. Only a short month or so ago, I gave him £5,000 and told him that was the last he'd see of my money. I'd hoped the shock would bring the boy around, make him realize he had to settle down instead of wasting his life on gambling and gallivanting around with that wild woman. Which wild woman was that? Loretta Nolan, of course. You mentioned gambling, Sir Francis. Have you any idea with whom he gambled or who might have wanted to kill him? I wish I did. He told us nothing. He only came around when he needed money. And when I told him there'd be no more, we never saw him. Just about broke his mother's heart. <laughs> there, there, Gertie. We still have one another. <laughs> Moments later, everybody. This music is delightful. I've something you ought to know about Master Guy. One morning, rather early, about four or five weeks ago, I heard a terrible clatter downstairs, so I came down to investigate. It was Master Guy just coming home. He was in a terrible state, all battered and bruised with a fresh cut on his forehead. I asked him who did it to him, and he wouldn't say. I think he was afraid for his life. <gasps> oh my God! Why? <laughs> The plot thickens. So we have from the father's own mouth that Loretta and Guy were always gallivanting out together and he was always gambling away the monies. He had £5,000 from the father and that was it. He's got cut off from there. Maybe he had gambling debts and he was trying to pay them off and he was getting beaten up because he's like, Where's my money? You got my money? Where's my money? Oh, the plot thickens, it sure does. But what does this mean in the long run? What I don't get is if uh, Loretta and Guy are fairly close, why doesn't Guy marry Loretta if the, if he's after the, the Francis and Loretta's estate, you know, their money to pay his debts? Why is he so fixated on marrying Francis? When clearly he doesn't even like her company, he'd rather gallivant around with Loretta. Okay, so we got to investigate Faraday's... Faraday's? Hang on, what was it called? Um, Richmond's party, that's it. Loretta last saw him at Richmond's party. Let's try going to the Old Bailey. Should we try that? Certain that Edward Hall can get them in to see Miss Nolan at Old Bailey, the pair head off to visit the young barrister. I understand that Wilfred Robards is considering taking Miss Nolan's case. He might be able to help you. 
If you'd like, I can arrange an interview with Frances Nolan. She's being held downstairs, you know. Moments later, will Johnny Music to take us all the way there? We might be able to help you, Miss Nolan, if you could just remember what happened that night in Mr. Clarendon's room. Well, that's just the trouble. I can't remember anything except seeing Guy's body across the room and the pistol in my hand. Where did you get the pistol? I've no idea, though the police assure me it's mine. I didn't know Guy was at Halliday's. I've never even been there before. And why would I shoot him anyway? We loved each other. There, there, Miss Nolan. <laughs> Stiff up a lip. Thank you. Miss Nolan, what is the last thing you remember before the room at Halliday's? Oh, hot cocoa in bed. I beg your pardon? Oh. Well, every night before I retire, my maid, Grace, brings me a cup of hot cocoa. How nice. Oh, yes. And before that? Well, before that, I dine with Dr. Trevelyan, as I do every Sunday evening. My sister, Loretta, is under his care. The doctor and I have become good friends over the years. He left at 10 o'clock, as he always does. May I ask, where did you first meet Guy Clarendon? Uh, at the country estate of Cornelius Oldwine, in March. My sister, Loretta, was attending a party there. I suppose things got a bit out of hand because it seemed she dived into a fountain. She caught pneumonia and I had to go and fetch her home. Guy was also at the estate, and that's where we met. And he immediately began paying court to you? Oh, heavens no. Nobody seems to take much notice of me. I suppose that comes from having such a wildly attractive sister. That's why I was so surprised when he called a few weeks later. We began seeing a great deal of each other. We went on long carriage rides, had picnic lunches. It was all quite lovely. And then on the 5th of June, he declared his love for me and asked for my hand in marriage. I was so happy. I couldn't have killed him. How do you explain your presence at Halliday's? Well, I can't. It's just like the other two times. You've had memory losses before. Between... Yes, twice in the past month. The first time I found myself atop a horse in Hyde Park with no recollection of how I got there. The last thing I remember was having lunch with my sister, Loretta. Then there I was, atop a chestnut mare. How peculiar. The funny thing is, I'm terrified of horses. You mentioned there was a second time. Yes, a few days later, I met with my solicitor, Hiram Davenport. Then the next thing I know, I'm at the Newgate Street Station. I consulted my physician, Dr. Mason, and he was quite as baffled as I was. One last question, if you will. What is your relationship with Gerald Locke? Oh, Jerry, he's a dear old friend. Though I'm afraid we had a falling out of late. He said some very unkind words about Guy. There was a lot of names and information packaged into that interview. I'm really glad we paid her a visit, but it's now confused me awfully terribly. One thing that stood out to me was that uh, Dr. Trevelyan, she said how she had breakfast with him on the Sunday and that Trevelyan was also Loretta's doctor. Here's what I'm thinking. Loretta, she fancies a bit of Guy herself, but she's a bit too much of an idiot. But Guy Clarendon meets... Francis, a very delicate lady with lots of money who isn't going to be troublesome towards him. Upon their engagement, Francis is over the moon, but Loretta is incredibly jealous. So starts to plot to have her removed from the situation. Practicing at home, she spikes a drink that makes her kind of blackout and then places her on a horse just to see if it works. And it does. So then speaking with her doctor, knowing that they have breakfast together in the morning, she arranges for him to spike her drink. Maybe the doctor is Harry Potter. We have, we got to speak to him. We need to know who these people are. Right, so where should we go now? Where should we go now? We go to Francis's house. I know she's not there anymore, but maybe there's... Because they had breakfast in the morning, so maybe there's some clues left behind. Maybe some cups we can check. Deep in thought, Holmes lights his pipe and snuffs the match, allowing Watson to lead him down the street towards Francis Nolan's residence. Tell us, who was at home on the evening of the first? Well, just Miss Francis, sir. Oh, yes, of course, and Dr. Trevelyan. What time did the doctor take his leave? Oh, let me think. It. Oh, it must have been 10 o'clock, because that's what time he always leaves. What did Miss Francis do after her guest left? What she does every evening, sir. Well, she asked for a cup of hot cocoa, which I brought her straight away. 
Then she read for a bit by the fire. Later, when I went up to bed, I passed her room and the light went out. What time would that have been? Oh, let me see. Oh, I know it was 11.30 because the clock chimed. Then I went to sleep. Later, I was awakened in the middle of the night, right in the midst of the most peculiar dream. You see, I was barefoot and trying to buy a pair of shoes as and... As fascinating I... as all this is, could we get back to what it was that awakened you? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> well, it was something that I heard, or thought I heard. I listened for a bit, but that was the end of it, so I went to sleep again. Later, I awoke at 7.30. I always wake up at 7.30, except, of course, on Sundays when I sleep until 8. Mm. As usual, I began to prepare Miss Frances's breakfast. I had no sooner got into the kitchen when I heard the front door open and close. Well, I ran to the front window and peeked out, and there was Miss Frances walking down the street. And why do you deem that so unusual? Well, she never leaves before she's eaten one of my currant buns. Oh we okay. So the housemaid give us a big old bit of cluing going on there. I put forward to the court that the drink was spiked and that as, as she fell asleep and she passed out, Loretta took her from the bed and then kind of dragged her out the house, making a bit of noise as they left, threw her into a horse and cart, got her to the residence, and then what next? <laughs> this Dr. Trevelyan, let's go talk to him real quick. We've got to find out how she's getting poisoned, how she's getting drugged, whatever. Dr. Percy Trevelyan, ooh we On their way to Dr. Trevelyan's home. Home shares his thoughts with the good doctor on the case thus far. Watson nearly nods off. Doctor, we understand that you dined with Francis Nolan on the evening of July 1st. Yes, that is correct. We dine every Sunday. Her sister Loretta has been under my care for some ten years. First at the Mesmer Braid Institute and then in private practice. Without breaching physician-patient protocol, would you mind telling us the nature of her illness? She never quite recovered from the overwhelming trauma of watching her parents being blown to bits. I quite understand. <laughs> As is often the case with young orphans, they tend to create fantasies about their parents. Miss Loretta Nolan truly believes that her father was the King of England, making her a princess. Do you think her unconventional behavior stems from that fantasy? Absolutely. As a princess, she believes she can do no wrong. I must say that she's worlds apart from her sister Frances. Do you know Frances Nolan well? Yes, rather. Through my treatment of her sister, I've known her for years. Let me say that it is difficult to believe that Miss Frances is capable of murder. She has a quiet, unassuming personality. An act of such direct confrontation would not be at all in keeping with her character. Were Loretta and Frances close? I know without a doubt that Miss Frances loves and cares for her sister, almost as a parent would a child. Miss Loretta, well, she loves her sister as much as she is capable of love. Doctors are fantastic for giving evidence because they're so respected and noble peoples. It seems that with Loretta having seen her parents get blown to pieces, that she's not been the same ever since, and she truly believes that she's a princess, that Daddy Faja was a, a king. Clearly, she's a disturbed and deluded person that isn't quite sane. Perhaps as much means that she doesn't have as much access to her family's money. Maybe her sister has to give her the money. So that might explain why Guy Clarendon is more interested in Francis and why Loretta isn't really appropriate for him. But the doctor, Dr. Trevelyan, gives a, a great character reference for Francis to say that this is something she would never do. There was the other, another doctor, uh, Dr. Mason, who is Francis's physician. She had previously visited him in regards to her blackout. So let's go find him. Feeling that they are on the right trail, the pair head off to Dr. Mason in hopes that some of the medical mysteries of this case can be solved. Tell us, Dr. Mason, have you determined the cause of Francis Nolan's blackouts? It's the strangest thing, really. I examined her thoroughly and found nothing physically wrong. She could not recall receiving a bump in the head, nor did she complain of dizziness. All I could suggest that was perhaps she was overtired and prescribed rest. It remains a complete mystery to me. Oh, thank you for nothing, mm. Dr. Mason. What was the name of the, the, the club, the event, the thing, the party that uh, Loretta and Guy was at? Richmond's party. Right. Who is Richmond? And I want to talk to him. Otis Richmond? Is this him? The ride to Mr. Richmond's home is uneventful, except for the part where Watson fell asleep and seemed in dire need of a drool cup. At first, I thought it must have been one of the servants. 
After all, there was no sign of a search, and nothing else was disturbed. Did you question them? Thoroughly, but none of them would admit a thing. It really wasn't until Hardinge and Bessie Durth were robbed, and the newspapers referred to us as victims of the society burglar, that I was certain it wasn't any of my staff. By the way, can you recommend a good housekeeper and valet? Excuse me? I went to visit him in regards to this murder, and he's talking about theft. He got burgled. Newspapers. What was- what is this? After a series of high-profile burglaries perpetrating on some of London's oldest entitled families, Scotland Yard has announced that the increased police presence in the city's best neighbourhoods has brought an end to the reign of the so-called society burglar. Speculation is rampant as to the identity of the suspected thief. One theory has the thief of foreign descent, well placed in a diplomat's office, but with no criminal in custody and no evidence, nothing is known. That was June 26th. But nothing on that paper. Next paper! Society burglar takes climbs to foot claims. Should I, should I say claims, not climbs? That elusive and so far successful burglar, commonly known as the Society Burglar, has gotten their way with jewels valued at £14,000 by the seven victims to date. Speculation continues as to the identity of the burglar, who seemed to be acquainted with the various and sometimes ingenious hiding places of his victims' jewels. The other striking aspects of the emotional Modus operandi are the taking of only one select piece each time and the occurrence of all thefts when the victims are not at home. We have provided for the interest of our readers a list of the various jewels stolen and their respective values. Wait a second. In Guy Clarendon's hotel room, there was that banking paper that had money written on it. Did, did someone get a photograph of that? Does the money on that match the values of this? How about that? Uh, Richmond, Otis Richmond said about a Leeds. Let's check this person out. The tiara was a terribly valuable piece of jewelry and it meant so much to my wife. She has been under a doctor's care since the theft. In fact, just yesterday, she took a room at the hospital. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Is she prone to bouts of nervousness? Mm, perhaps lately it seems so. She was absolutely undone when young Clarendon poured champagne down the bodice of her gown at Richmond's party. Come to think of it, that was the last time she wore her tiara. She was so proud of it. And several of the ladies at that party admired it openly. Where did Lady Leeds keep the tiara when she wasn't wearing it? In the bottom drawer of her bureau, where she kept some of her more frilly undergarments. Were there any signs of a search? Drawers left open, that sort of thing. No, and that's what strikes me as so peculiar. It's as if the burglar knew right where to look. How about that? So we have Guy Clarendon on the location of the Miss Leeds tiara theft on the last night she was known to wear it, and the person who stole it knew exactly where to find it. I've written it down on my notepads because it's more easy to read, but we have five other people who had things stolen from them. The R. Baker, Hardinge, B. Lewin, Darth, and Judd. So let's go pay them super quick visits to see if they had a thing or two to say about the night their things went missing, and perhaps we can link Guy Clarendon to the scene of those crimes. Roger Baker. Well, it was an unfortunate event, but to tell you the truth, to me, it was a, a mere bauble, a trinket. I had it replaced for my wife the very next day. And nothing else was stolen? Not a thing, and it appeared there'd been no search. Okay, he wasn't bothered. Next person. H.C. Hardinge. My wife and I were guests at a small dinner party at the home of Otis Richmond. We arrived home sometime after midnight. And as my wife was putting away her finery, she noticed the bracelet was missing from her jewelry box, and we summoned the police immediately. The servants were questioned? Oh, they've all been with us for a number of years, and I haven't the slightest suspicion about them. But yes, the police did question them thoroughly. All were in bed asleep by the time we arrived home, and none heard anything untoward. And nothing else was taken? Surprisingly not. Yet you're positive that the bracelet has not simply been misplaced? No, my wife actually put it on while she was preparing for the evening, and then she decided against it. I saw her put it back in the box. Where does she keep the box? In her dressing table, there's a special compartment in the side of it. The box fits in rather neatly. Okie dokie. And that was on the same night as Otis Richmond's party. So after Richmond got robbed, they must have gone straight to their house to go rob it? Next up, we have a B. Lewin. A Bradford Lewin. 
We were at a reception at Buckingham Palace for the new head of the China delegation. Upon arriving home, my wife discovered that her favorite ruby earrings were missing. We noticed nothing else out of place. No sign of a search, that is. And none of the servants had heard anything suspicious. Interesting choice of music there and audio quality was terrible. Bear seed off! My husband, God rest his soul, gave me that necklace for our 50th wedding anniversary. And woe betide the blighter that took it, I say. I can certainly understand your consternation, madam. May I assume that you were out the evening it was taken? Oh, yes. The house was completely empty. Sybil, my housekeeper, and I were attending the mass charity ball at St. Mary's for the benefit of unwed mothers. It wouldn't surprise me if that scoundrel was responsible in that direction as well. Society burglar, indeed. He's of the lower classes, mark my words. Do you keep your jewels locked up? Oh, I keep them in a very secret place. A box made to look like a copy of Great Expectations on the bookshelf amidst the other books. Hiram, my late husband, thought of that. But the thief went right to it. How about that? I'm sure she didn't have great expectations of that happening. Ah ha ha ha! We're not getting anywhere with this, but we have one last name, and then that's all the names off the list. A Judd. Who Judd? Nancy Judd. It's all quite upsetting, you know. The pendant belonged to my great-great-grandmother, and I was hoping to pass it on to my daughter. And now it's gone. There, there, Mrs. Judd, you mustn't worry. With Holmes and I on the case, we're sure to recover your pendant. Uh, by the way, where did you keep it when you weren't wearing it? In the toe of my old black button-ups. And I don't recall ever having mentioned that to anyone. Or at least I don't think I did. Okay. Helpful? No! Right, I'm running out of options here. Running out of options. We have stolen things. We have a dead guy, Peridon. We have money owed. Money stolen. Uh, so, the bank. What was the name of his bank? Stab in the Dark Bank of England? I mean, sounds like it might be his bank. It wasn't the Bank of England. Uh, Cox and Company Bank? Mr. Clarendon appears to be a frequent depositor. Yes, but it looks as if he's afraid the money will burn a hole in his bank book if he leaves it in too long. That is exactly what I was looking for. If we compare the date and the prices of when the things were stolen and their appropriate values, basically cross-check that babouche with our bank incoming. May 30th, £5,000 into the bank. That's the 5000 that his father gave to him before cutting him off. The next, June the 12th, £500. Well, that's just 10 days after um, Baker was robbed of his £500 pin. <gasps> the next, June 16th, £1,000. That was five days after B. Lewin had their ruby earring stolen on June 11th for the value of £1,000. June 18th, £500. Yeah, I can't account for that one. The deposits, they're also withdrawn that the very next day. They sit in the bank for just one day before being withdrawn again. We still don't know why Francis is blacking out. We still don't know how Loretta is doing it if she is indeed our real suspect here. We don't know who the man in black clothes is. Kind of hit a bit of a dead end. Like, I I have the case. It is Loretta. She's framing Francis. Guy is the person who did all the, the thievery. And he was cashing it in his bank and withdrawing it to pay off gambling debts. But we still haven't got that, that final bit of evidence that locks everything into place. So what I'm going to do is we're going to get a clue book. Clue hints. Dr. Watson's going to give us a heads up of what he thinks might be a foot here. Thank you, Watson, for suggesting we go to the murder location, which was the very first thing we did, you bloody idiot. So what is the story? What, what happened here? Guy Clarendon, well-to-do man, travels in good circles, has a gambling addiction, and has racked up quite a bit of debt. Unable to pay off and now cut off from his father, he must, alter he must seek alternative ways in order to get the funds required. So he starts stealing from the well-to-do people in his inner circle of society. Selling the goods, he gets the cash, takes out the cash and gives it to the people threatening him, saying, where's my money? All the while, Loretta Nolan, a well-to-do rich person that's slightly insane, likes to party, uh, and so does Guy Clarendon. And she falls in love with him. Unfortunately for her, Guy Clarendon falls in love with Francis, or rather Francis's money. 
Loretta orchestrates this opportunity to take her sister out of the question and take Guy for himself. But somehow Guy dies. Sister is to blame. Uh, that's where my story falls apart, right? The only option remaining is to go to the judge with the evidence we have collected and see if we can fight for Francis's right to not be guilty. Armed with information about the accused murderess, Francis Nolan, the detectives cut a swath through the London fog and head to the Queen's Court. No, gentlemen, you haven't done a thorough enough job of investigating yet. Do continue your sleuthing. So rather annoyingly, I've had to go through all of Watson's hints, losing loads of points in the progress, but we finally got something new. Shinwell at the Raven and Rat Inn has an interesting account of Claridon. It seems Claridon owed £7,000 to Kilgore for gambling debts. Let's go pay Shinwell a visit. Porky Shinwell! Sure, I remember Clarendon. He and his lady friend used to stop in here from time to time. Usually on their way to Kilgore's gaming parlor or coming back from it. Rumor has it, Clarendon was in to Kilgore for a sizable sum. Do you happen to know how much? Seven thousand pounds was the figure I heard. Got to the point Kilgore wouldn't allow him in the door. Clarendon made a big fuss till Gus Bullock stepped in. Clarendon backed down pretty quick. Don't blame him none. Nobody in their right mind would want to mess with the likes of Gus. Do you think Bullock was involved in the murder? Nothing you could tell me about that bloke could surprise me. Anyways, Kilgore makes it clear to Clarendon that he wants his money. Then, a month or so later, Clarendon comes in all smiles, and he and Kilgore get none like chums. Figure Clarendon must have paid him back. Then, Calvin Leach steps into the picture. Now, who's Calvin Leach? Leach deals in what you might call stolen property. Square dealer, too, give you one half the value of the article. What does Leach have to do with Clarendon and Kilgore? Usually nothing at all, but there it is, Leach. Kilgore and Clarendon meeting late at night just as thick as thieves. The meetings continued on right up to, well, the night before Clarendon's death. Very interesting. Now, we've been standing here jawing, and I don't recall hearing anybody order nothing. What'll it be, mate? We've made progress, everybody, thanks to Dr. Watson's thoughtfulness of the hint system. Right, let's go talk, if we can, to either Kilgore or Calvin Leach or Gus. Calvin Leach. Suspecting that Leach may have a connection to this case, Holmes and Watson head off to visit the suspected fence. Watson decides to conceal a small derringer just in case. That's a gun, by the way. What did you learn of Calvin Leach? I think Porky Shinwell said it all. Did you ask Leach about Clarendon? Yes. What did he say, Watson? Oh, yes, of course. He said he'd never heard of him. Oh, that was helpful. But Kilgore, what about Kilgore? Any luck? Yes and no. I beg your pardon? Yes, Kilgore has met Clarendon once or twice, but no, he insists he's never heard of Calvin Leach. And you believed him? Dead end! Is there a Gus? Anybody call Gus in the phone book? Oh, Gus Bollock. There we go. Okay. Who are you and what do you want? Dr. John Watson, sir. I wondered if you might be kind enough to answer a few questions. About what? <clears throat> Guy Clarendon. <laughs> that Welchin little weasel, what about him? He's been murdered. Ah! I'd say he got what he deserved. And if you don't clear out of here in two seconds, so will you. Oh, quite. Ta-ta. <laughs> oh, quite. Ta-ta. Amazing acting. Tremendous acting, everybody. Okay, well, yeah, Gus had the scar on his cheek, the Harry Potter scar. Gus is the guy that's been roughing him up and who's witnessed at the hotel. How does this change the timeline of events? Well, we've nearly got every bit of the puzzle. I still don't quite know how Loretta is connected with the death. Guy Clarendon has a gambling addiction and runs up a debt of £7,000 to Kilgore at Kilgore's club. Kilgore says, where's my money? And starts to put a lean on him, bringing in his muscle, Gus Bullock, or Bullock Gus. Things aren't looking so good for Guy, but then things turn around as he starts stealing the jewellery and then brings Kilgore in on the jewellery. Kilgore then brings in Calvin Leach, who can then sell the jewellery, and everything is hunky-dory. Or is it? 
They were meeting until the night before his death. It is my assumption that Gus followed him back to his hotel room, snuck in through the window and killed him. But then how does this involve Loretta and Francis? Because Loretta is framing her sister, but I don't know why. That's the best theory I got. And with no more leads, I'm going to take it to the judge and see if he agrees with me. Hear ye, hear ye. The Queen's Court now stands in order. Finally! Right, we're going to court. Mr. Hope, I understand you've been looking into the murder of Guy Clarendon. That is correct, my lord. Would you be so kind as to tell the court who killed Mr. Clarendon? Certainly, my lord. Yeah, about that. <laughs> Having a thought here, everybody, I'm leaning now towards Loretta being the killer, and here's my theory for this. We know that she really does believe she is a princess and her father is a king. Guy Clarendon had these jewels worthy of a princess. Maybe upon finding out that she that he had sold them and they were gone, got her so angry she killed him. And then went on to blame the sister. Yada yada yada. Right, I'm doing that, I'm doing that. Um Nolan, Nolan. It was Loretta Nolan, your honor. I see. And what was Loretta Nolan's motive for killing Mr. Clarendon? Well, I think she had her eye on their tiara. And in fact, the, that someone remarked upon that when we were interviewing the people who had their things stolen. Ah, uh, greed. Pure and simple. Now, have you determined why Francis Nolan went to Halliday's? I have, my lord. Please inform the court. Why did Francis Nolan go to Halliday's? She didn't. She was hypnotized by her sister. There you go. That's that one. I didn't even think about hypnotized. Okay, Habush. Not a sisterly thing to do at all. Is there anything else you wish to report to the court? Yes, my lord. I believe we've also solved the case of the society burglar. You don't say. Who is the guilty party? I'm so glad you asked, because the guilty person is... Guy Clarendon, everybody. Guy Clarendon was straight from the upper crust. Why ever would he turn to a life of crime? But he owed money, but not to Calvin Leach. Uh, Calvin Gore, uh, Kilgore, insisted that he do it to pay off his debts. It's really crappy answers. He owed money to Kilgore. He got cut off by his father, so he stole them to pay off Kilgore. Kilgore didn't insist that he do it to pay off his debts. Why would Guy Clarendon do such a thing? Father cut him off financially. Well, you've done an admirable job in resolving this mystery. I'd say you're on a par with just about any other armchair detective out there. I would suggest, however, that you rethink this case again, thereby improving your sleuthing skills. That was clearly the wrong answer. Let's try again. <laughs> I talked with Mr. Holmes about Guy Clarendon's murder. As far as clue points go, here's how you did it. You can listen to how Mr. Holmes did it or try again and see if you can do it better. Let me let me try again. But I don't want to play the whole bloody game again. Holmes' solution? Well, Watson, we should be very pleased with ourselves on this one. Yes, indeed, Holmes. Two cases solved for Scotland Yard. Though I doubt that Lestrade will consider himself in our debt. Two? Yes, indeed. First, the society burglar. Clarendon was £7,000 in debt to the gambler Kilgore. Unfortunately, he was in his father's bad graces and he was flat broke. Do you suppose Kilgore sent Bullock around to rough Clarendon up? Good deduction, Watson. You're learning. That's why he moved into Halliday's, to escape Gus Bullock. And to pay off his debts, he took to burglary. Right you are. He acquired a black sweater, trousers, and a pair of black canvas shoes so as not to be seen or heard in the dead of night. He chose victims of his own class whose social comings and goings he knew well and whose homes he'd visited often. I still don't understand why, after he'd settled in at Halliday's, he changed rooms. Elementary, my dear Watson. To be at the back of the hotel with a vine-covered trellis conveniently leading in and out of his bedroom window. Quite so. Positively clever of you. May I continue? Oh, please do. On the 1st of June, Bullock tracked Clarendon down and confronted him in the lobby. Clarendon paid him the £5,000 that was given to him by his father. But he still owed Kilgore £2,000. And that was the same evening the society burglar struck for the first time. So pleased you've been paying attention, Watson. Soon after that, Clarendon, Kilgore and Calvin Leach, a known trafficker in stolen goods, were seen together. Notice, if you will, that 
one half the value of the first three society burglaries is equal to £2,000. Half the value being the price normally paid by Calvin Leach for stolen goods. Notice also that this same amount is equal to the balance of Clarendon's debt to Kilgore. Fascinating. So with his new vocation, Clarendon now had an easy source of income. Quite so, as his succeeding bank transactions evidence. On the day after each of the next three burglaries, Clarendon made deposits. Everything went along swimmingly, and by June 30th, his debt was paid. But the tiara was stolen July 1st. Yes, Watson. Apparently, young Clarendon thought he'd found himself a new vocation. He might have lasted longer at it if he'd chosen something else to steal. Whatever do you mean, Holmes? Loretta Nolan's delusion that she was born of royal parentage proved to be his undoing. If she took it, how did she manage? No one saw her enter or leave. She came and went the same way Clarendon did. Via the trellis. She was armed with a derringer purchased at S. Goth's in her sister's day. Clarendon returned from his night's work and poured two glasses of wine in celebration. That's when Loretta Nolan shot him and took the tiara. How wicked of her. Not nearly as wicked as what she did next. What? She went to her sister Frances's home and hypnotized her. She then proceeded to instruct her to go to Clarendon's room with the derringer and fire it into the ceiling. Incriminate her own sister? But why? Ah, if we could determine that precisely, we could start our own institute. Sick mind, no doubt. But tell me, Holmes, how did Clarendon know the precise locations of each of his victims' jewels? Excellent question, Watson. Although there is no clear-cut evidence for this, I can only assume that Loretta Nolan must have been in on it, too. The only way Clarendon could have known the locations of the jewels was if the victims themselves had told him where to look. None of them recalls having told anyone, but in fact they did tell someone. Who? Loretta Nolan. She managed to hypnotize each of the ladies whose jewels were stolen and got them to reveal the precise locations of the family treasures. And left them with no memory of having done so. Precisely. Astounding, Holmes. Elementary, my dear Watson. <laughs> Elementary, my dear Watson. But there you have it. I mean, even though the judge did dress me down as a schoolboy that should go back and get a teacher's diploma of how to do the good sleuthing skills, I was given terrible wordings that made me fall down like from grace. But as I explained to you before we made our choices, our summaration, our theory matched with Holmes's description just then, with the exception of just the, the ending bit about Loretta Nolan hypnotizing the people to find out where their jewelries are. We nailed everything else, but there is no explanation exactly why she set up her sister to fall. Jealousy, most likely, because Francis and Guy were going to get married, and she didn't want that to happen because she enjoyed hanging out with Guy. But that was that, everybody. The case is closed. Well, this has been Sherlock Holmes in the case of the mystified murderess. It was a little long-winded. There were ups and there were downs. But overall, I had a nice time. It was definitely jolly and nostalgic. I'm not sure how fun this is going to be to watch. I guess it would depend how I edit it together. So fingers crossed I do a good job in that department. Did you enjoy this? There are two more episodes is this something you would like to see? I understand that this is not for everybody. I'm not expecting this video to do well at all. But it, Sherlock Holmes is special to me, to the channel. It's as much a part of the channel as Titanic is. I would love to do the other two episodes. But it ultimately depends on you guys. Let me know in the comments below. And on that bombshell, thank you for watching. Rate, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye, everybody.